All right. Welcome to another episode of Duck It. Today we have Jay Deep, a good, good friend. We've worked together. Um, we've been friends. We've uh, kind of mentored. Given, I mean, you've given me advice. I've given you advice. And we've even recently worked together on your newest, um, I would say, venture, Phoenix. Uh, welcome to Duck It. Um, I want to start by kind of asking you the obvious question. You've been in mobility for as long as I've known you. I met you at Karim. Uh, you were leading up strategy. Um, you had a really cool, interesting role at a very kind of uh, critical, um, I would say, juncture in, in, in the history of Karim. We were going through hyper growth, transition, trying to get a hold of, of, of the organization. Um, and then you left and you went to Grab. Then after Grab, you joined Cirque and you launched Cirque in the region. And now you have Phoenix. So are you a mobility guy? Is that your business? Well, first of all, <laughs> thank you for having me. That's quite an opening. I think I told my whole story. And right? I exactly. think we're done, right? Yeah. It's the shortest podcast. Because I want to get to the juicy stuff. <laughs> uh, no, thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, I'm very uh, excited to be on this podcast. Big fan of, of Duck Life. Of Duck It, uh, all the, the work you guys have done in the last uh, few years, uh, and the you. authenticity that you're bringing to the ecosystem and creating really uh, amazing brands we can be proud of. Absolutely. Right? Um, so thank you for that. And uh, I guess short answer, yes, uh, I am a mobility um, uh, focused uh, you know, yeah. entrepreneur, I guess. Um, but I think mobility, what we've learned, right, even with ride sharing, right, is that uh, mobility is a means to an end, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, the pe reason people move is not just to move, right? It's because they want to do something. They want to get somewhere. And, uh, and, and from that point of view, you know, mobility can be much more, right? And we're yeah. seeing it even with the ride, ride share companies, right? Yeah. Building their super apps, diversifying into food and payments and, and other uh, deliveries, other, yeah. other uh, verticals. And, um, you know, so our, our mission at, uh, at Phoenix, for example, is not, you know, let's move, right? Uh, it's let's uh, unleash Enable. urban potential, right? Uh, so that we can all get to where we're meant to be and do what we're meant to do. Absolutely. And, and how would you say that's changed over time, over the last few years, especially during COVID and, 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 and and all that. I think mobility in its in its essence has changed. How do you think the I guess the industry or your business has adapted to that? It's been a tough year for everyone, <clears throat> right? Uh, and that's not an insight. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can vouch for that too. It's been difficult, yeah. <laughs> right, uh, but I think what it's also brought to light is, you know, how um, how mobility is a regressive tax. Right. And um, there, like when we look at you know, the impact on society from COVID, right, there is a privileged few who are who can work from home. Yeah. Right. And there are a select number of jobs where that is, is, you know, still continues. But a lot of people can't. Right. And they've faced much harder hardships. Right. And uh, and. Uh, and, and we see that uh, with Phoenix as well, right? Uh, the, the idea is that mobility as a regressive tax means the less you make, the more you pay, right? Uh, as a share of income and uh, in terms of time, right? Time is a cost, right? Uh, if you're awake 16 hours and you're commuting four hours a day, that's a 25% tax on your potential. Wow. Never really thought about it that way, but it's 100% true. <laughs> yeah. And and this is affecting you know billions of people. Now we all live in cities, right? Uh, and the rich, you know, they live close to work. They own a car, and they can get to work in you know ten minutes, fifteen minutes on their own schedule. And everyone else, you know, taking public transit, they're walking to bus stops, metros, changing lines, stuck in traffic when there's public transit available, right? And uh, and and they have a real. Uh, material uh, cost uh, and, and considering where can they even work it's true right i think it's a real limiter <clears throat> remote work sounds like a privilege it is 
It is, and and you know, it is going to be a part of the future. But uh, you know, we're not uh, you know machines plugged into the matrix yet. Right? <laughs> uh, we we live in a hopefully real world. Not. <laughs> right? Hopefully yeah, not. Yeah. Right? We live in a real world, yeah. and uh, that means you know. It's not bits, it's atoms, like we got to get around, yeah. uh, people need to get around. And uh, mobility is a core limiter or enabler to that. And and now if you compare um, <clears throat> where ride hailing started, so private car, um, and now we're looking at micro mobility, we're looking at, you know, scooters, bicycles, etc. How, how is, how are they different fundamentally, from a business standpoint, in your mind, in terms of Scalability, investment, usage. How would you describe the differences? Look, both of us were in ride hailing. Yeah. Right? And the promise was, or the vision, right, was that we're going to change the way people move, eliminate private car ownership. Yeah. Right. Uh, you don't need to own the car. Uh, it'll be more convenient, more affordable. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, the the challenge, uh, what we later uh, realized. You know, was the cost structure, you know, has a fundamental uh, floor on yeah. how efficient it become, uh, both from a cost standpoint and from a infrastructure efficiency standpoint, right? And and uh, it took me time to realize this as well, right? Uh, first at Kareem, and then I moved to Grab, and you know, this whole bi bicycle sharing craze was was yeah. taking off in China. And it was a bit bewildering. Like, why are people investing, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into these, you know, mechanical bikes, right? Which is like technology that's like hundreds of years old. <laughs> like, what is the yeah. opportunity there? I, I didn't understand it at first, right? Uh, and I approached it as a skeptic. But then as I started unpacking, you know, and, and humor me here, unpacking the, you know, the model, yeah. uh, I think my perspective has evolved, right? And, and so fundamentally, you know, the way that we move in cities is, is not really changed much in the last hundred years, right? We buy a car, we move in a car and it's a amazing, uh, you know, liberating vehicle right? because it can do so much. Yeah. Right. But the business model of the car has also been primarily a retail model, right? And that's not changed much, mm -hmm. right? And uh, as a retail model, right, that means me as an individual, buy it, I take a loan, it's expensive. Right for my for me and my family, yeah. I'm like you know what this one device needs to needs to do everything for me because yeah. I'm paying a hell of a lot of money for it, right? Uh, for me and my family, so that's why we have the five passenger seats, right? That's why we've got the cargo area for luggage, you know, groceries. That's why we can go at, at fast speeds right on the highway, right uh, on the road trip, and uh, and and now you know. Uh, when I think of micro mobility, you know, we're not trying to replace the car. We're trying to unbundle the car because essentially the car is a bundle of use cases and it's a bundle of trips, right? Uh, maybe it's 10,000 trips, right? And when you look at the actual distribution of, of those trips, very small percentage is it using all of those features that the car of offers right? as a general purpose vehicle. Very few of them have five passengers with luggage. Going, you know, 150 on Sheikh Zayed. <laughs> right. It turns out that, you know, most of our, our movement is in cities. Yeah. Right. 70% uh, of those trips are single passenger. Right. Uh, half of them are short distance and you're in traffic. You're going 15 to 20 kilometers an hour. Right. So now, uh, if you think of that as like the primary uh, oh, yeah. use case, right. And now look at how is it being serviced. Right. 2,000 kg of steel moving 100 kg of passenger, 20 kilometers an hour, right? Like, like where is your dollar going? It's not going to move you. It's going to move the car, right? And uh, and, and that's the floor that we felt with ride hailing as well, because now you've also got the private chauffeur, yeah, right? Uh, so how affordable can that become, right? And uh, with my mobility, we're saying, okay, let's optimize for that single passenger trip. So now you've got a vehicle that's 20 kgs. 1% the mass of a car, half a percent of an electric car, by the way, which is 4,000 kgs, right? Uh, so you're like, okay, now I'm, I'm moving, I'm paying to move me. That's great, right? Uh, it's already electric, 90% energy efficiency, or just 30% of the combustion engine. It's actually 100x more efficient 
per kilometer than a car, right? Uh, it's already self-driving, right? You drive yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no private chauffeur, right? And no autonomy sure. dependency, right? Uh, so uh, now you can bring down the cost of service substantially, <clears throat> right? And uh, and and uh, this means it's it's far more affordable uh, in mass, you know, for for riders. But it's actually also better for cities, right? And this is the other perspective, the other stakeholder that we need to account for, right? Um, because the cost that cities bear, right, or society bears, right, those are externalities that actually we all bear individually, sure. but as indirect costs, right? Like we just think, oh, it's a system, we can't change it, right? Uh, so our traffic is a big one. Pollution, air pollution is a big one. A lot of people have health issues because of air pollution. Yeah. Global warming, right? Uh, transportation is actually the number one contributor of carbon emissions. Yeah. Right. And so now, uh, when you look at, you know, more people moving into cities, the problem is getting worse because more people are getting into cars. Traffic's getting worse. The emissions are increasing. The personal productivity tax is increasing. Right. And and cities, their hands are tied. Right? There's no space to actually expand the roads. Yeah. Right. Like most cities, you know, they don't have space. Right. They're old cities. They don't have space to yeah, expand the roads. Right. And uh, most of the time, they don't have the resources either. They don't have unlimited capital. Right. And 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 I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think I think the way you kind of unraveled the whole, um, you know, use case of the single traveler versus a car, absolutely hundred percent true. Hundred percent true. Um, if I look at the two cars that we have at home. I don't think I've ever used either one of them at their full potential in terms of what they were designed to achieve. And so I, I, that's a bit mind blowing to kind of hear it that way. So, so I think that's true. It's actually worse. 95% of the time it's not even being used. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. On top of all that. So a hundred percent in terms of, um, you know, value, um, versus your investment, et cetera, it definitely makes sense on an individual basis. And then from a community and society basis as well, even further. Um, in terms of kind of the cost that it has on society, for sure, that we don't achieve, you know, that we don't pay attention to. But what are, you know, it's it's kind of funny because ride hailing was was hailed, you know, by cities and consumers around the world as like this huge, amazing innovation that was amazing. Everyone was totally for it. Even if governments were somewhat difficult to it, they were still hyper welcoming to it. Micro mobility doesn't have that warmth that I think ride hailing did. Micromobility has been treated as a nuisance for cities. Whereas everything that you're saying is 100% true. I don't think anyone can contest that, but it's being treated as the nuisance or the bad brother to the ride hailing business. Why is that? Is it because it's physically in your face in every corner and people get you know annoyed by it? What is the difference between micromobility in your mind? Why is it being treated and given such a bad rep? You know, it's a complex question. And uh, I, I just... You're gonna to have to hold me back because <laughs> sure, 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 sure. I'll, I'll I'll try to censor this a little bit. No, uh, nothing to censor. Just and there's a lot of nuance to it. Okay? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so just to complete my train of thought on uh, positive impact, right? Sure. Uh, basically, if you replace a car lane with with micro mobility, you move six x the passengers, right? So it's not five percent more; it's five hundred percent more. Just from a capacity. Just from a throughput standpoint. Sure. Right, and so like if cities start shifting their mindset to like. How do we build for people, not for cars, right? How do we move more people, right? Uh, this is, you know, yeah. absolutely going to happen, right? It also increases access to public transit, right? Uh, yeah. Which is the most efficient way to move people. Make it easier to get to the metro, easier to get to the bus, right? Uh, and suddenly, you know, those uh, investments are getting more utilization as well. And you're increasing property value and making it easier for people to work and, you know, reducing traffic and pollution and the whole economy benefits, right? Better mobility creates better economy. So that's kind of just putting a pin on that. Yeah. Right now, uh, ride hailing versus micro mobility. Uh, I think you know, there's several differences. One is, you know, ride hailing is, I call it an incremental innovation, right? Using the current modality of transport, right? And cities are built around the car, right? Uh, so there's no change required. Right, uh, it just you're making it accessible by optimization. Right, yes, it is absolutely, <laughs> and and on some dimensions, it's made a tremendous impact, right, sure. in safety and 
convenience and access, etc. Right? Um, uh, it's also harder to identify a right hailing vehicle because <laughs> it blends in yeah. to all the other cars that we yep. see in the city. Right? Uh, it's within the infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then, uh, you know, I think the whole, like, there had not been this sort of uh, innovation in transportation before. So, like, transport agencies were also, you know, not prepared and caught off guard, right? Yeah. Uh, and so they went through their own learning curve with ride hailing and got smart that, hey, you know, there are some policies that we need to manage, right? Uh, and how these sorts of services are are enabled in our sure. communities, right? And, and so micro mobility, I guess, is the benefactor right? <laughs> of, the, of the sophistication. And look, I think actually it's a good thing because uh, what's different with scooters and e-bikes and e-mopeds, right, uh, is that uh, you know, infrastructure is not built for it today, right? And uh, to be fair, like we're using public space, right? It's yeah. not that you know, Phoenix has bought the land or rented the land where we're parking our, our free-floating scooters, right? It belongs to the city, right? And it is the city's, the city's you know, uh, prerogative on how they allocate that space and what's best for that city. Right? We've got to earn that that uh, trust and confidence and uh, you know, inform and then with data prove you know, what, what the positive impact can be. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, so those are some of the factors, right? Like one, just smarter uh, regulator agencies, two, um, you know, different form factor where infrastructure isn't there yet, three, easier to identify and spot it right? versus right hand car. And <clears throat> so, so I understand that I think you're, you're very good at how you answer that question, by the way. I think, I think, um, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think, I think re regulators, um, you know, play a huge role in the success of, of these types of, of solutions. Um, once they recognize it and, and once they understand it, um, you know, in, in all the markets where we've, you know, kind of worked in, in ride hailing or not, once the government understands its potential, um, they, they kind of unleash it. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but fundamentally also from the ecosystem, I'm saying from an industry standpoint. So, you know, uh, whether in the region or globally kind of micro mobility and scooter and bicycle companies are kind of being kind of generally are, 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 are not a, a sector that people show a lot of love to. It's actually like the butt of jokes sometimes. It's like, oh, I'm just going to go put a hundred million in the scooter company. You know what I mean? Um, mm. And so I wonder where that comes from because <clears throat> the fundamentals to me don't really stack up. Like for some reasons, to to my knowledge, the economics are not less favorable than right hill. Sometimes quite the contrary. Um, the solutions that they're solving are even truer to the ecosystem than let's say right hilling would be. So the the climate warriors, the eco kind of friendly kind of mindset, the entrepreneurs, the tech guys are way more eco conscious, and I don't see why they'd be kind of, you know, not showing any love to, you know, the, the, the scooter businesses. But I'm just wondering, what you said is true, I think. But I think what I was alluding to was why does the industry, the ride hailing industry, give scooters a bad rap? And I, I, I don't know if you have the answer, but uh, I, I don't, I, I definitely don't. But I'm, I'm wondering what your view is on that. Yeah, actually, I think it boils down to, um, you know, what is the narrative and sentiment on the category, right? Sure. And, and so, uh, like if we did an apples to apples comparison of ride hailing economics versus micro mobility economics, completely double standard. I mean, yeah, micro mobility yeah. companies are already, I mean, they're generating a very healthy. Uh, revenue, uh, many of them are actually, you know, EBIT positive, right? Things that Most right no right hailing companies, right companies <laughs> yeah. have sniffed, right? yeah. even the publicly listed ones. Sure. Right. And so there's absolutely double standard there, right? Uh, uh, part of it was just you know, the early um, actions, I guess, of, of the first movers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which were more kind of growth mindset, yeah. uh, not uh, focused on you know, economics and, and like remember this is like a new form factor right uh, there sure. was a lot of inefficiencies initially and uh, and now as you know, vehicles start to improve and become more mature and 
operating models improve, right? We're, we're addressing those, right? And, yeah. uh, but you know, early days, yeah, they burned a lot of money, and uh, you know, investors became wary of it. I think the other piece, the the third piece is. Um, This is not a winner takes all industry, micro mobility. And ride hailing was very different that way. Because uh, ride hailing, you had a commodity in supply almost, right? Yeah. Uh, where the driver partners, the captains, you know, they would use both apps, yeah. right? And consumers would use multiple, would use both apps, but they would basically go wherever it's cheaper, right? And it became, uh, you know, a subsidy game, right? Sure. It was the deepest pockets, uh, rider subsidies. Captain subsidies, yeah, right, uh, and then you could get you know winner takes most, right, and, and micro mobility, the fleet is owned is owned, right, and so it's more about asset management, right. Uh, so if I have you know a uh, few thousand scooters in a city, no one else has access to that, right, and uh, and, and and so that that's a very different equation. Yeah, yeah. Right? it's more about like how can you drive performance on your asset. Uh, versus you know being a winner takes all uh, model, and I think that had raised some uh, questions from investors. Right? Uh, is there any barriers to entry? Is this just a commodity business? Do we want to invest in this? And <clears throat> is the micro is micro mobility inherently over time going to integrate with these other modes of transportation since it's a piece of that trip? If you know what Thank I mean. you for highlighting that. Yeah. Actually, uh, we we think of it as a multimodal network, yeah. transportation network, and you know, micro mobility is just one piece in the jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's in many ways, it's a glue, right, that facilitates access to different modes. Right. Uh, yes, getting to, you know, the bus and the metro, but even getting to car sharing. Yeah. Right. Uh, one of the challenges with car sharing is just, you know, it's not. There's, you don't have such a high density of vehicles. How do you access it conveniently? Right, yep. we can be that first, you know, hundred meters, five hundred meters to the, to the shared car. Yeah. Right. Um, and uh, I think this is like the shift that uh, cities need to adopt as well. Right. Is let's think of multimodal networks, not just cars. Especially in this region, we've been more car centric uh, historically. Right. And now there's like more investment in public transit and then realization of, oh, we've got to make it easy to get to public transit, et cetera. I mean, to their credit, the RTA in Dubai has been talking about, you know, this solution, this perfect solution since ride healing began. Mm -hmm. And they launched uh, Suhail, which was an app that was meant to do that. To be honest, I've never downloaded it, so I cannot speak for it. But the multimodal kind of solution that breaks down all the pieces of your trip in theory exists. I don't know if the implementation or the execution or even the adoption has happened. I assume not, but <clears throat> I'm wondering that, you know, do you see a world where these modes of transportation are only going to integrate if they're vertically done within one organization? Or do you see a world where Phoenix partners with Kareem, partners with Uber, partners with, you know, um, you know, other mode, the RTA, the Metro, the bus, do you see that world happening? Do you see private companies, you know, government companies, international kind of brands and local players all integrated into one platform? Is that realistic in your mind? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, to some extent, Google is trying to achieve that. Yeah. But, but I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if that's Look, possible. I think effectively, it doesn't need to be in one app for the objective to be achieved, right? Consumers. Are going like if they know okay, you know I want to take the metro and I got to get there. You know there's the metro station. I can scoot there, bike there, etc. It's just not convenient though, right? To have to jump and assume that you know that there is existing scooters on location at that metro station. That when you get off that metro station, there's going to be a cab there or not. Like the convenience is not there, right? Ultimately. I don't. I don't think it's as inconvenient as we might think. Right. Maybe we're creating a problem just to solve it. <laughs> yeah. right. like, the, like the trip planners or whatever, like the Suhail app, right? Uh, <clears throat> bring it all into one. I mean, that's great. And some cities will will solve it, right? Either the city will have their own app that, you know, mandates that all these services integrate into and, you know, maybe they will rely on a tech provider 
to offer that te technology because it's not their core competency, right? Uh, some cities there may be, uh, you know, a market leader that's able to integrate meta solutions, right? In other cities, it'll be you know just a mix of independent uh, solutions that people stitch together on their own, right? Uh, I think that uh, objective will still be uh, realized over time, right? Um, and it's important. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I fundamentally try to draw parallels between industries. And when I look at like ride hailing and trying to get all these modes of transportation to be kind of integrated, I think of the same problem that marketplaces have in the Middle East. So we, we, we have a customer, we have a client at Duck Life, and they are basically a marketplace for groceries and food solutions. Um, and what we've seen is that inherently, at the end of the day, the model is kind of flawed in the sense that because all of these stores, all of these retailers don't have inventory management systems that integrate into this marketplace, having reliability and convenience is a bit difficult because what we're showing you in the app might not be what we're able to deliver. And guess what? Most people want the same things and those things are always out of stock and then the experience is flawed. And so it kind of sounds like the only way ride kind of solutions are improved is with a proper integration of everybody together. And it seems like that's the role for a regulator, not a private company. If the end kind of benefit is supposed to go to, let's say, a, a city commuter, right? It, it kind of sounds like the best way you can achieve it realistically for the benefit of the, of, of the commuter is having a non kind of uh, biased kind of player, kind of like a government player. It sounds like that's what it is to me. I might be wrong. I, Maybe I, I'm pulling think, conclusions. Well, I, I think you're onto something there, right? Um, the example of the flute platform is an interesting one. Yeah. Right. Uh, and like with vertical integration, you can have much <coughs> higher uh, quality control and exactly. control the end user experience. And you're seeing this from like some of the dominant demand platforms around the world. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And you'll probably see more of that. Right. Um, but uh, if you have a fragmented market, right. Uh, then you have to think in terms of a marketplace, you know, why would someone want to integrate with you? Yeah. Right? And, and uh, it's not like a dual sided or a triple sided marketplace, right? Uh, and so if a, if a single uh, platform you know, wanted to aggregate all of that, they need to have a good, a really compelling proposition, right? For those stakeholders to plug in because no one likes to give up the customer relationship. Sure. Right. Uh, I think there will be some. There will be some cities that it, it is uh, accomplished. It may yeah. not actually be a transport app. Maybe, for example, a payments app. Yep. Right. Uh, like we're seeing in China, right? Alipay yep. uh, has many services. For example, and they did the same thing with micro mobility. Right? Absolutely. Several micro mobility operators, and it was like a payment layer, and people could use it, right? To uh, book a, a bike, and then you know go to the That's metro true. and pay for your <clears> metro <throat> ticket. That's true. It was quite shocking, actually, when, when Steve and I, we, we used to go to China once a month for like 10 days for like almost a whole year. We did that trip. Um, it was shocking the amount of bicycles that there were in China on literally every corner. And the way that you would rent them was with your um, Alipay um, kind of app. Um, <clears throat> it was incredible. A whole city was functioning behind a payment app. I think that's so interesting. And I, I can't wait to see what happens here from a payment um, kind of solutions in the region. I think that's the last piece to the puzzle in terms of giving it that catapult into kind of you know digitization that we've all been It is a for. huge piece actually because right now it, there's so much friction on payments. It's incredible. Yeah. Right? And it, and it's really uh, you know challenging all sorts of digital providers and any entrepreneur who wants to start a new service, right? It limits how how you can convert. It's incredible, right? yeah. Such a huge point of friction for for a lot of solutions. So yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask maybe a more sensitive question that, that you can decide not to answer if you don't want to, but um, obviously, the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> obviously you, you kind of launched, developed and grew uh, the Cirque business in the region, right? And you know, Cirque got acquired um, and then at some point they decided that this market was not interesting for them anymore and they exited out of their own will. When when I look at your kind of tenacity and speed to come back to market, it basically tells me a couple of things. It tells me one, you're like, what the hell? This is a super interesting market. Why would you do that to the market? And two, there's a personal motivation there. It's like, hey, I almost reached my potential. 
with this market, with this technology, and you kind of took the rug from under me. And now, you know what? I don't need you. I'm going to build it myself. How, how true is what I just said in terms of the two points that, one, they didn't recognize the potential of the market, and two, they didn't allow you to reach your own? Is that politically correct? <laughs> <laughs> No, this is this is a duck it podcast, right? So you could say, you know, fuck it and just answer, or you could, or you could, you know, be on your PR points. But it's up to you, man. How do you want to answer? Look, obviously, yeah. Like the Phoenix team, me, IQ, and the rest of us, yeah. right? We know, we firmly believe there's a humongous opportunity for micro mobility in the Middle East. Sure. And uh, we we believe it it requires a localized approach. Right, uh, because the region, and you know, right, uh, is not uh, cookie cutter across you know all the course, cities yeah, and yeah, markets. Yeah. Right, it's a very diverse region, very fragmented region, a lot of opportunity. It's undercapitalized uh, when it comes to uh, micro mobility, substantially actually. Like other geographies have had hundreds of millions, billions of investment. This region has had almost nothing. Right. Um, and I think it was just a, I mean, in the case with Cirque, right? Uh, you know, we we did validate, you know, there's an opportunity here, and then you know we were acquired by Bird earlier this year, and um, you know the pandemic, of course, uh, disrupted every everything for everyone. Changed people's perspective, right? And yeah. uh, so, I don't uh, fault Bird at all. Uh, I think you know they were facing an uncertain climate. Um, entering the summer in the Middle East, we had been shut down across all of our markets, and um, you know they had to also preserve their capital for their future and for their core markets. Middle East wasn't core, right? Let's be frank. Yeah, it was non-core. Um, so understand the you know the rationale, but um, like for us, we're like, yeah, no, screw it. In the depths of the pandemic, we started our efforts, right? Yeah. This summer, and uh, when no one, there's all the doubts about uh, micro mobility as well. And yeah. you know, who wants to do it in the Middle East? Even the biggest guy is shut down, right? Uh, yeah, we'll prove them wrong. We've proven them. We've proven them wrong. And we will continue to do so. Yeah, and I think it's super interesting. I think, <clears throat> you know, I um, I posted something on on LinkedIn the other day, and I um, uh, it really resonated with people because. Often I post something and you see engagement on the platform, but for the first time I posted something and my WhatsApp lit up. It's the first time that people felt like because they read something that I wrote, they wanted to speak to me personally. And you and me even spoke about it. And <clears throat> I really, the more I kind of mature and learn in life and the more experience I have and the more, you know, kind of uh, successes and failures that I go through, I start to analyze the underlying motivations of why I do things. And I'm, I've decided to be super open about myself uh, and my experience. And I think you and me can draw so many parallels in terms of um, the things that motivate us and, and the tenacity of where this, you know, where it comes from, et cetera. And I don't think there's any harm in being honest about that, right? Um, and everybody feels it. And I knew that everyone felt it because they all told me they did. Um, and, and, and I wrote something basically along the kind of summary of, you know, of all the people that I know that are successful and successful can be measured in so many ways, but professionally successful in terms of achieving the things that they've set for themselves professionally, the visions that they have. Of those that have achieved those visions, I've kind of come to the conclusion that there's always an underlying personal motivation that trumps everything, right? Um, and and I and I put it into three buckets. I said, you know, I want to prove it for, to mom or dad or both. Uh, two, um, you know, it's you know prove the naysayers wrong, and then three was. Um, um, what was the third one? Uh, a comeback story. And sometimes it's all three. Um, and, and I look at kind of my career so far. I think every time I've been able to achieve something, there's been a little bit of that as an ingredient in the recipe. There's, oh, you know, this one, I need to prove to dad that I can do it. I want his approval. If he's watching, look what I did. And sometimes it's, you know, I failed in my last startup. This one, it's my comeback, you know? And so I wonder for you, because you, you're a startup guy for as long as I've known you. Um, you know, you, you, you were, you know, instrumental at Karim. You were uh, big at Grab. You, you, 
you, you, you came back to the region, you did Thurk, and now you're coming back again with, with Phoenix. And it's so, you know, I know where the brand comes from, where Phoenix comes from, where the word Phoenix comes from, to rise from the ashes. Um, I just wanted to ask you, how much truth is there in that for you today? I mean, competitive juices are good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? right. Competitive juices get, gets you going. Right. And uh, I, I won't deny, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, being able to rebuild, you know, from scratch, get supporters behind us and then, you know, come in the market and, and, you know, win public acceptance, consumer, um, you know, popularity very quickly. I mean, 50 days, we became the regional leader, right? Uh, and there were like 10 operators, right? And, uh, so, so of course, I mean, that feels good and it's validation, right? Uh, that, you know, we're on to something here and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's motivating for the team as well. Right. Uh, but that's not the core of, of what we're doing. No, no, sure. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not alluding or I'm not, I'm not yeah. suggesting that it is. It's just, I draw parallels sometimes just when I see them and I, there's one parallel that I can't help but but recognize at the moment is when we were at Kareem, as a brand, as an organization, as a culture, as a story, it felt magical. It felt real. It felt authentic. Phoenix has that. Unlike other brands, unlike the Cirques, the Limes, et cetera, the Birds, the, the, those brands feel manufactured. This brand and this organization feels real the story, the underlying motivation, the passion behind it. Maybe also because I know you and IQ personally and we help build the brand, but it feels fundamentally different. And I feel like the market recognizes that. I feel like that personal touch, that personal motivation, it's kind of like the brand wears your emotion. You know what I mean? And I feel like it feels oddly different with Phoenix. And I feel like that's what consumers crave at the end of the day. I don't think that you might have purposefully wanted to do that. I think that inherently you do that by, by by nature. But it feels like the brand is fundamentally that. It's really, really true and authentic to who it is and what it's trying to accomplish through, I think, the channeling of its founders and its team. You know what I mean? I think that was a natural evolution of how Phoenix came to be versus how other organizations have just been kind of manufactured, created, and put out. And I think that's why the market is responding to it differently. I feel like brands, and I'm a brand guy, so maybe that's why I'm saying that, but I feel like brands that are authentic and true are are interpreted that way. I think consumers see that. Would you agree? I mean, it's uh, very humbling to be put in you know the same conversation as Kareem. Yeah. Okay. Because we were there, yeah. and we know like like you said how magical it was. Yeah. Right. And it started with the mission and how inspired we were to you know uh, simplify people's lives, create an awesome organization that yeah. inspires. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, st I still know those words, right? <laughs> uh, years later, I wasn't even there that long. Right? And I remember it. Yeah. Right? Um, and uh, maybe uh, 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 you're right. We are trying to be authentic. I mean, we are, we are authentic. And this is something we firmly believe in. And I think that makes it much easier because you know what you need to do. Absolutely. And uh, you speak truth, right? And that truth uh, resonates with the market. Right. Uh, when we say that, you know, we're committed to the market, we believe in this opportunity, we believe it needs to be done the right way. We're in it for the long term. Right. Cities believe it. They see that we're, we're putting our ourselves on the line. And, you know, we have, you know, the uh, you know, we, we bring the credible approach on, on how we're doing it. Right. Uh, and, and our brand. Right. It's not just I mean, the colors. I mean, Having you know the different colors is about diversity, inclusiveness, yep. so that everyone can access opportunity <clears throat> and unleash their potential, right? And I mean, we didn't talk about this today, but that's like something that I even draw on, like from my own history, right? Uh, how yep. um, you know, I, I mean, I realized you know what a responsibility it is actually to have opportunity, right? Uh, after you know several generations of sacrifice to, to provide this for me, absolutely, right? Um, and, and it's very powerful. I think it. It motivates people, it inspires them uh, to do their best work and uh, make a difference. 
And I think that's that's fundamentally what's missing in our region is brands that are authentic, brands that wear their emotions on their sleeves, and brands that will stand up for something and be vocal about it. And I think uh, Phoenix is one of those brands, and I'm super excited to see how that develops over the next few years. Um, I want to ask you about something else as well. I think the way you guys came to market as well is unique. I think um, the brand in itself is is, is unique um, and comes with its own kind of story and mission behind it. Um, the, the way that you raise money, um, the amount that you raise, where you raise from, super unique as well. I think um, just to touch on that a little bit. So you, I'm not sure if this is a fact, but you raised potentially the biggest kind of, I would say, sorry for the people who can hear the plane. <laughs> you raised fundamentally one of the biggest funds to go to market with, right? Uh, three point. 3.8. 3.8 million dollars was raised. Incredible. I don't I can't think of another organization that's achieved that. So I think kudos to you guys and, and, and to your story and what you guys have accomplished. And it's a testament to who you are, not just to your performance, but you know, your track record, you and IQ and the team. Um, so congratulations on that. And 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 obviously one of the biggest participants um in that was an Israeli um fund, um, which <clears throat> given the market and how things have changed um, around here was also kind of very new, um, you know, unexpected um, and, 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 and quite different. And I wanted to ask you, you know, how did that come to you know, play and, 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 and how is that impacting your business, both the amount of funds that you've been able to raise in terms of validating your business model and, and, and from where the money came from as well? Well, the leading investor came from and, and how that's kind of you know, helped your business and, and, and shape things for you guys um, here in the Middle East. Yeah, th- thank you for I mean, those kind words. Um, I mean, we were very fortunate, I think, to uh, to have access to these resources to pursue our mission. Yeah. Right. Uh, and one of the largest pre uh, pre product uh, yeah. investments, right? And um, uh, there's no such thing as an overnight success. Yeah. Right. Uh, it's not like it, it just we we said, hey, we're raising money, and like it landed in our lap. <laughs> it, uh, it, it it was a struggle. It's still a struggle, not just for us, but for yeah. most entrepreneurs. Uh, I would say all entrepreneurs, right, uh, in this region and beyond. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, the fundraising process is is challenging, and uh, I think in this region um, there are there are some more obstacles than what you would face in other regions right i, I think especially for pre-product uh, uh funding right uh without uh kind of uh, traction uh it's just not that, that frequent right yeah. um, and uh, so yes we went through our own struggle uh, our own discovery process as well i think it helps us uh, refine uh you know what we're doing uh what what makes uh our approach effective, what is our, our go-to-market plan, et cetera. I mean, and those are very fair questions, right? Um, and yes, we we also you know, raised the first uh, investment from an Israel-based fund, right, uh, in a UAE-based uh, company. And uh, that happened not long after the Abraham Accords were signed, right? Uh, yeah. So I think, you know, four or five months later, you know, the market perspective of those accords is, you know, you know, more developed than it was you know, when it was first signed. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I'll be lying. I mean, if I didn't tell you that, you know, we also had our own trepidations. Right? <clears throat> uh, yeah. How would this be received? Um, you know, would people, um, you know, uh, take it uh, the wrong way? And um, I think. What convinced us is, you know, I'm, I am personally, you know, I, I believe in humanity. Yeah. Right. Uh, like I'm, I'm Indian. My co-founder is Pakistani. Right. Uh, that in itself is. Uh, right. And uh, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, race doesn't matter to me. Right. Uh, uh, where you're from doesn't matter. Right. And, uh, and it was the same thing with Maniv Mobility, right? Uh, it wasn't, you know, the fact that they were, uh, you know, based in Israel that was 
you know, exciting or not exciting, right? Um, or, or persuasive or, or you know, sure. not persuasive, right? It was the fact that, you know, they were domain experts in mobility, right? Investing in, in a way that we never had access to in this region before. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, depth. I mean, they, they basically, for background, I mean, they take old mobility capital, deploy it in new mobility opportunities. Their LPs include BMW, Mitsubishi, Nissan, Renault, Hyundai, and many others. And they have a portfolio of 30 mobility companies across four continents around the world. Right. Uh, wow. You don't find uh, VCs with that domain focus. Uh, to date in the Middle East. Yep. Right. Uh, so, so for Phoenix, I mean, it is a, it's a huge asset to have, Absolutely. have uh, an investor with that profile who can uh, not just bring capital, uh, but bring, you know, know-how relationships, uh, and help us as thought partners, you know, build the business. And they did it because they believe in actually the platform and, and the opportunity of micro mobility in the Middle East, yep. right? which a lot of people didn't. Right, yeah. because they are, they'd seen in other markets and like, of course, this will work here. And and I'm so curious. I've always wondered what that meant, right? So, you know, industry experts, experience, you know, focus, depth in that industry, et cetera. What does that mean for Phoenix in terms of leveraging that experience through Maniv? What does that mean in your day to day? Like, what, what support do they give you? If you could give us some references, some examples. I, I've never really understood what it meant. Uh, I've yes. never seen it. I, I guess because I've been so many startups that supposedly VCs or investment, you know, c- companies promise that, but I've never seen it. I've never felt it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wonder what that means for you guys. And I'm sure I'm sure they're probably listening. So, <laughs> so, so pick your words wisely. But um, no, no. But, Look, I, I mean, I can uh, speak the truth sure. here as always, right? Um, like one, it means that they understand the business model sure. inside out, sure. right? Uh, and um, you know, it's not like they're raising eyebrows about us investing in capex, right? Okay. And uh, uh, and you know, utilization, etc., regulations, etc., right? Some of the challenges in the business. Sure. Right? Uh, we're not educating. I mean, they're already educated, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so now, when we're planning the course, you know, for like the next quarter, the next year, the mindset, right? everything's kind of the same. Yes, there's nothing much friction. Mindset there, right? Yeah. Um, I think they look at you know what are accelerants for the business then, right? Uh, like uh, debt uh, financing, for example, which yeah. makes sense right? for a capital intensive business. Sure. Why should you be paying it all with equity, yeah. right? Uh, why not match it with with your revenues, right? Sure. Uh, so they've been opening some doors for us on that front, makes sense. right? Um, connecting us with other mobility entrepreneurs, right? To mm-hmm. exchange uh, experience, uh, you know, that some new categories that we're considering, for example, sure. you know, we can talk to uh, like Revel, which is a emoped company in the US that they've invested in, right? And learn what, you know, what their experience has been in the States, right? Um, those are just a few examples, right? Uh, uh, getting talent, even attracting uh, future investors, right? Uh, from their own uh, network, uh, you know, those are yeah. things that we're activating. Right, um, then we'll see how it plays out. Cool. Um, uh, we're almost an hour in. I just, um, I'd like to shift a little bit. I'd, I'd like to um, kind of get your perspective on more personal kind of topic um, to end it. Um, you know, entrepreneurs are, are builders. You know, we, I think you and me also are, are, are the kind of people that will always build. Um, today it's Phoenix. Tomorrow might be Phoenix 2.0. The day after that might be a different organization. Um, but we're, we're constantly driven to, to build things that have a positive impact in our lives or, or, or our community's life, et cetera. And um, there's no secret that with, with time, it, 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 we pay a price, right? Having that constant wanting to build, 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 that commitment to that energy, <laughs> that momentum is, um, it, it catches up to a certain uh, you know point. And, uh, and, and when I look at your kind of, um, at least since I've known you, when I look at kind of your your path so far, it, it it's amazing, but I, I can't help but also think that it's exhausting. Um, and I'm only saying also from my own, own experience as well. Like I've I've been 
relatively following the same path and it's been an amazing career it's been it's been fantastic but i I can't help but come to the conclusion sometime and ask myself when do we slow down when do we take a minute to kind of um enjoy it when do we sit back and feel that um or do we in your mind is it something that we're always going to do and we're just going to have to find a better way to do it so it doesn't have a negative impact on our lives i'm wondering where, where where you stand on that because i feel like we're going to build 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 whatever it is that we're building and we might not take a second to take a breather and um and kind of have the lifestyle that we envision because we're always too building we're always too busy building i wonder for you on a personal basis if you can step aside from your um if you can take off the phoenix hat <laughs> How, how do you feel when it comes to kind of managing um, your lifestyle? Because I know you, you're you a workaholic. You're always going to build. When is it going to be kind of, when are you going to reach that point where you say, okay, I'm happy. I've, I've done it. When do you feel that's going to happen? I, I don't know. <laughs> and, and I think you're giving me too much credit, Chris. I, I've not accomplished much yet. Right? Uh, but that depends on what you're measuring, right? Yes. So, right. so if it's like, I'll be honest, I have, I have that number that I'm going after, right? I have, you know, maybe that impact and influence that I'm envisioning in my mind. But that thing can always grow with time and it has grown over time, right? That number I passed a long time ago, now I'm going after another one. That impact I'm, I've passed, now I'm going after a bigger impact. You know, I'm, I'm starting to wonder how do we kind of set that finish line where we can start to breathe a little bit and put less pressure on ourselves, right? I'm just wondering because I look at you and I, and I, I can't help but see the same thing that I see in myself sometimes. Like, oh man, we're going to keep going, keep going. When are we going to slow down? And I wonder how you contemplate that personally. If there's any advice, any learning to anybody out there that's listening. Uh, I think I'm still figuring it out, right? I, I don't have the silver bullet. Right. Um, of course, I mean, passion is, you know, hard to, um, it's contagious, yeah. <laughs> it right. Uh, hard to contain. And, uh, I think you got to look at, you know, what are the most important things in your life? You got to make time for it. Right. Uh, basically it comes down to like prioritization, right. Uh, and blocking time like hard blocks on your calendar, even, right? Uh, <laughs> Lauren does that for me every day. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, yeah. you know, we, we live not, I mean, for purpose, but like our purpose is more than, you know, our, our job. You are not your job. Yeah. Right. Uh, and there are many other aspects to life. Uh, and yeah, we have one life on this earth. We want, we want to experience it all. Right. Uh, like family. I mean, we've both got, daughters yeah. right um, very very important i try to you know present be present every day right yeah. uh, and I'm still figuring it out right uh, i don't know if it'll be a hard stop anytime but uh, it may evolve right yeah. uh, the the type of uh, contributions that we are making uh, to the world uh, like right now you know we're trying to build something with phoenix Hopefully we, we get there right? and we, we're really in early days right? uh, and then maybe, you know, 10 years from now, there's another way of contributing, which is not building from the ground up. I don't know. It could be yeah. mentoring or giving back or who knows. Let's see. Maybe we'll do this podcast in five years and see what happens and then we'll check in then and see what's the story on, on Phoenix on our personal life. Anyhow, thank you so much for making it in today. Um, really appreciate you. Really appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, thank you for making it to our podcast. Thank you for having me and thank you for all of your support, Chris. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. All right. Thank you. <laughs>